So we're just going to say welcome everyone to this um, next session um, of us, a Kanban trainer. Um, usually we have this with the pro Kanban community or the, the Kanban community in general. Um, today we have Louis Philippe. Louis Philippe is uh, the second time we have someone from, usually we have had speakers or, or trainers from, from Europe and so on. Um, Louis Philippe is, is um, what time is it for you, Louis Philippe? It's lunchtime ish. It, one, 1 p.m., yes. 1, 1 p.m., okay. So we got, we got Louis Philippe, um, great colleague from, for us from, from Quebec. Um, lots of experience and and we're going to spend like an hour um, um, answering questions and answers. So how does this usually work? You know, this is an informal event. Um, if you have questions that you would like to um, ask, um, please put them in chat. We will be looking at it and trying to find out, you know, those questions and, and, and ask them. Um, but we will invite you to ask the questions if you want on audio and video. Um, and participate as well. So it doesn't have to be just um, LP and I who are talking here for an hour. So if you feel that you you want to engage in a conversation, please let's do it. Yeah, um, it is an informal one. You know, sometimes there will be questions that we might have to say. Look, I like the contest to, to be able to answer that effectively, and that's that should be okay. Um, but let's see how it goes. Yeah, um, the session is being recorded. Hopefully. It will be something that will be on on YouTube in this in this in the YouTube channel um, even tonight, and we'll put the link later on, or we'll share it. And we we'll always invite you to join the Pro Kanban Slack um, community, um, where we can have these kind of questions and conversations, and basically just support each other with questions, successes, sharing ideas, sharing stuff. And thank you everyone for being here. And especially thank you today for Louis Philippe for giving us like an hour of your of your busy schedule. It's, it's a real privilege to have you, my friend, here. Um, I've been looking forward for this for a few months, um, and and we're here. Um, especially as well being the, the May the fourth, as you say, this is not a Star Wars day. This is Kanban day. We just need to say May the flow be with you. May the flow be with you. Yeah. And, and there's a T-shirt also, if I remember, Jose. And there is a T-shirt with that. Yeah. Yes. There's a T-shirt. Okay. So, Lufeli, can you want, can you tell us a little bit more about your your you know your background, your experience with Kanban, and we just give people give people time to write questions while we're doing this. Sure, absolutely. First of all, I want to thank everyone to take time in, in your schedule uh, to come and talk with us, learn more about Pro Kanban, my experience with Kanban, and mostly with Scrum, as I'm from a a Scrum background and am a Scrum trainer for almost ten years with Scrum.org. About Five years ago, I, I took a training from a, a fellow Kanban trainer called Daniel Vacanti, and and my perspective on Kanban really changed at that point, and, and it made a, such a, a significant impact that I started only teaching one class from the Scrum.org curriculum, which is the Scrum class with Kanban, the PSK. That's now the only class I'm focusing is, as I believe that in the next 10 years, that's just going to be the normal way that we're going to do software development or even in other teams. We'll use that part of Kanban within Scrum. And, and last year when I learned that uh, ProKanban.org was launching, I, I said to myself, well, this is a great organization. I, I want to join that community because it's so much focused on the community of Kanban people. So, so I'm doing this hour to help you folks answer any questions that you might have around Kanban and the Kanban guide, which I love also. And, and one first question is to stretch our hands a little bit is, uh, how many of you tried the open assessment on prokanban.org? There's an emoji at the bottom of your uh, um, um, Zoom window where you can kind of raise your hand. I, I'd be kind of curious to know how many of you folks have done the pro Kanban assessment. Raise hands or thumbs up or any. So there's a couple of yes. And and just by either a, a, a face on, on your camera or a comment, uh, was it hard? Was it difficult? Was it something that you enjoyed? Uh, uh, I'm kind of curious to call the, the audience uh, You can unmute yourself if you want to share your thoughts on this, yeah? Yeah, because what one of the things I also loved about uh, Pro Kanban, which I joined, is finally we've got an assessment to validate our learning on what it means 
to know Kanban, to do pro Kanban professionally. Uh, and it's been made by people like Jose and the whole community of Kanban trainers of this is what we believe is doing Kanban professionally. So, so I now have something with my students to say, or my, 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 my colleagues of let's go and validate your learning on what it really means to do Kanban. And we've got this awesome assessment. So yes, if there, you found some challenging questions, it, it's normal because we finally have something to raise the bar and say, say, this is what Kanban is. And we can all finally agree on what it is. It's those nine pages of a so much condensed guide. I used to talk about metrics, uh, Kanban metrics in my teams before the Kanban guide got out. And a lot of people were telling me, what are you talking about? Kanban, Kanban is just about a few uh, practices and principles. There's no metrics in Kanban. And I always went, there's, there's awesome metrics and we can use them in out, other, other uh, frameworks like Scrum, for example. And, and now that the metrics are inside of that Kanban guide, it, it broadens the conversation. It's, it's so much more enjoyable. Yes, so I'm looking at a, a comment of it's a bit like the PSK on, on steroid. I would I would agree on that comment. Yes, it's a much much more harder, and, and I find that's all good. That's all good. So so maybe uh, Jose, I'd be ready for a first question from the audience. I don't have any yet, so people are okay. taking their time. <laughs> okay, uh, so, so let, let me let me ask you um, let me ask you a question. But you you said like five years ago. Um, when you when you first came across Kanban, what was the what was what was the thing that made you suddenly say yeah, there's something here? I mean, you said like <coughs> Kanban is going to be the thing for the next ten years or whatever it is. Yeah, you said. I, I think. What, what is that? What? what think, why is that so relevant for you? I got almost only five minutes of humility in my life, and that's that's about the only five minutes in there. And, and I was looking at Kanban training from the, for the company I was working with. And Kanban for that training manual was just putting little, little avatars and moving stickies on a board. And I'm looking at that and there has to be more than that. I mean, I'm sure I'm missing something. Let's, let's forget about my ego. And I decided to find a great Kanban trainer. A lot, a lot of people in my network pointed to Daniel Vacanti back in Miami. So... I invited Dan to, to teach Kanban. And, and one of the first things that made much more sense is when we talked about managing flow, I never, I never thought that managing flow was keeping those two arrival rate and departure rate, or sorry, the other way around, arrival and departure rate uh, uh, parallel. I never mm -hmm. thought about that. And, and just again, by a show of hands or using your emojis to say, uh, when I'm talking about managing flow, how many of you folks online right now can refer to those two parallel lines. If, if I'm, I'm just curious, if I'm talking about two parallel lines, how many of you know what that means? Yeah, I've got a couple of hands raised. Yes, thumbs up. So other people are, are nodding no. Well, I think that's something that as a community, as, as a profession, we, I, I would hope that in 10 years from now, we all know what that means when we say managing flow and having those two parallel, line, parallel lines it would be as natural as explaining why we're doing a daily scrum every day, which I don't think we still know what it, why, why we do it, but I, I hope that in 10 years, managing flow, those two parallel lines, is just natural in our profession. It's even more interesting for me because those, those, parallel, those things about like creating stability, creating like, you know, managing flow and all the stuff, when it really, really comes to, I say, it comes to roost is when you take that beyond beyond the teams when you start looking at organizational level organizations that are in balance they, they don't try to do more than they should or they can and stuff like that that's, that's when those lines really really become powerful things so take, taking it taking it beyond teams and stuff like that yeah um i still see no questions people are very very quiet today if someone has a question that they would like to ask verbally please unmute yourself and ask the question otherwise we're going to have to keep improvising for our for an hour so i would have one or two questions oh alexander great thank you okay so the first one about little's law mm -hmm. and it's mainly about the color correlation of uh whip limit and cycle time yes okay. mm -hmm. And it says uh, not so much about throughput. So this is my understanding. 
And so my question it's, now is what we normally see when we in, in, uh, improve our VIP and reduce our cycle time, uh, the throughput increases. Okay. <laughs> so right. this is my observation. Okay. So my question would be, uh, where's the science behind this? Maybe okay. this could be the question or is it wrong or false or what do you see? Okay, so what what if if I heard the question correctly, you're talking about like obviously um, we're establishing a relationship between work then work in progress, cycle time, and throughput. Yeah. Yes. And is the question about how how do they relate and what's the science behind that relation? Okay, it's a little bit deeper. I would say so. I have some experience with it, and yeah. I teach this also. And mm -hmm. my understanding is so is there from the little law perspective. There is no correlation to throughput. Is this mm -hmm. entry yes or no? Okay. This is my first question. Okay, let's do the first one and then we yeah. move to the next. Otherwise, we forget the questions. <laughs> yeah. LP, do you have a do you have a an answer? Uh, my yeah. God. I have some. Okay, well, go <laughs> for it first, so Jose. I, I I I really don't have one correct. No, so I'll let you go first. So. Uh, it's because I might be misinterpreting. Uh, I just want to make clear that we get Little's law establishes that there is a relationship between, between those parameters. Okay. The one thing that is perhaps important to highlight, and I think many times is a myth in our in 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 our community, is that Little's law. Um, if I'm going in a direction that is not what you ask me, please tell me. Um, Little's law is expressed as a, as a law, as a mathematic, mathematical equation. Yeah. The, the, what we many times don't know or forget about is that in order for something like Little's law to be a mathematical equation, to be used mathematically, it has a certain set of preconditions that need to happen. Okay. And those conditions do not apply in knowledge work. It requires a certain level of stability, a certain cer certain things to happen, yeah, which just don't exist in knowledge work. Knowledge work is, for example, inherently variable, yes. intrinsically variable, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Little's law for complex environments should be called Little's guidance or Little's guide. It's not a mathematical expression. Uh, what we know empirically is that. WIP and cycle time are very sensitive to each other. So changes in WIP normally result in very quick visible change in cycle time. Throughput, it's a much more difficult metric to affect and impact. So you might be changing cycle time and, um, so, uh, and the one that we can easily impact ourselves or affect is, is, is WIP, how much work we take on. Yeah. You will, you might see cycle time and throughput changing, but there is no guarantee how they're going to change or how much they're going to change. You normally will see a, an impact on cycle time f fairly quickly. Uh -huh. Throughput, much more difficult to change. And and it might not be, I mean, I've seen people doing, oh, you know, a whip of 10, cycle time of um, 2, therefore throughput must be 5. Rubbish. Uh -huh. It just doesn't. It, we don't have the conditions to use like, uh, little slow that way. So when people use little slow mathematically, they they are misapplying little slow. Is that okay? Is that I don't know if I'm answering the question. I mean, I've seen this all the time. Actually, we see that even when we play Twig, the simulation game, you can see uh, that changes in WIP do not relate exactly to what happens in with with throughput in particular. Yeah. Um, Louis, do you want to, uh, I mean, do you have to add something to that as well? Great answer. That's all I have to add. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, long answer. Is that okay, Alexander? I mean, I've, I've heard that that's perhaps how you how you also see it in the real world, yeah? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Hmm? Uh, yeah, interesting answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, in the, UK, the... In, the, in the UK, interesting means rubbish answer. Huh? In the UK, when a UK person in the UK tells you that's interesting, it means that's rubbish. Okay, no, I don't <laughs> think this is rubbish. I'm from Germany. 
I'm, I live in the UK. I know if you're in Germany, <laughs> interesting is interesting. <laughs> no, please. Uh, what, what was the what was the what was your thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. So you said a little bit forget about the mathematics, no? Yeah. I had to remember what Louis said, no? So this is still important, no? I think also in knowledge work, isn't it? Yeah. And then when you have this, uh, the fun begins. Yeah, and that's the thing, for example, for, for Little's Law potentially to be used mathematically. Um, Little's Law has more application. This is why, for example, Six Sigma, um, it's so focused on redu redu reducing variability. Yeah, because in, especially in manufacturing, manufacturing complicated environments and using Cunarian terms, yeah, you, you need to have a much more um, stable, predictable, deterministic kind of environment. So you try to eliminate um, variability so you can calculate things like, hey, what is my production uh, rate for the uh, next uh, three days? Uh. It's more possible to do that in those environments. Sure. Once you go into, into complex knowledge work, it's all variable, you know, and, and those lines, um, it's straight if you if you picture them straight it's right. a simplification the lines are going to be all edgy mm -hmm. as you go along because they, they are there is variability there is instability yeah. uh, like but they have uh, to trend parallel that's yeah. the important yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 yeah but yeah. it's things like that 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 makes little's law just a guide uh, not a law in our environment cool yeah yeah cool answer thank you cool 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 um so there is a question from, uh, let's go to the next question. We have one from Craig. Craig, would you like to ask your question directly? Or you want to ask um, J, uh, LP of you, hybrid teams, would you, would you like to? I, yeah. Sure, uh, my environment is extremely noisy, no uh, but I'll, I'll do my best. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just, uh, I deal with the federal government here uh, mm -hmm. in the US mm -hmm. and we have a lot of hybrid teams. So uh, projects, um, well, they're, they're sort of legacy software that's been around forever and will be around forever. And uh, they're always in a, um, some form of uh, legacy migration and improvement. And um, their latest thing is, well, we're gonna go agile, but um, then you have sort of these agile teams, but then you look at the total number of FTEs on the project and the number of FTEs that are using agile and it's maybe 40% are using Scrum. Mm -hmm. And then this, well, what are these other 60% of people doing? Oh, they're just, they're helping out, you know? So, so it's hybrid. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, obviously you could, you know, I've always like to say, if you ask 10 agile coaches for their opinions, you'll get 15 opinions. Exactly. Um, so, because yeah, there's no one right answer for anything, but I'm just curious if you've um, dealt with this kind of thing and uh, and what what interesting uh, things you have to share for that. Any observations, lessons learned? Uh, two questions, uh, Craig. To just help me understand your context, what's the FDE? FTE. Oh, FTE, um, full time equivalent. Yeah, oh. full time employees. Yeah. Yeah. And those sixty percent are just FTEs that are floating around helping out here and there <laughs> um it's been hard for us to determine that um but yes it's a combination of uh folks who work on a mainframe on the COBOL pieces this is the social security administration so think of 40 year old mainframes um and they know everything they know where everybody is buried you can't get anything done without working with them but you're never going to get them full time it's impossible. Um, and uh, I forget what the name of the, that person is in the Phoenix project, but there's a person that everyone depends on. <laughs> um, I forgot the, the guy's name, but anyway, uh, they're like that. And so there's some people like that. And there's some people from I the field. Oh. Yes, I think so. Hmm. Good one. Yeah. <laughs> it's been too long to reread it. Right. So, um, but uh, also some people from the field, subject matter experts, but also just programmers, just teams. And they're like, you're not doing Scrum, what are you doing? Well, you know, what we've been doing for the last 15 years. So They call so, it life cycle. Uh, yeah, I, I can kind of relate as I'm uh, based in Quebec City, there is a lot of gov government work here provincially being done. So I, I do land a lot of contracts, which 
seem to be similar to what you're, you're talking about. Um, usually I'll leave it as it is if it doesn't hurt anybody because it's just because of the legacy of the organization and I'll st start to act on when those people are becoming more and more constraints to the whole system or the productivity of your scrum teams or your agile teams. And, and from that point on, well, is there maybe some uh, learnings or some knowledge that that person can start to spread around or teach to other person? How much how much uh, uh, responsibility that person has to be focused on only one thing or can she spread that responsibility and try to uh, um, um, st stop limiting that work only to that person? Has that been an avenue that you've tried, uh, Craig? Yes, yes, exactly. In fact, um, when we first started, um, because it's, it's not just hybrid teams, they're also component teams. So they're solidly doing component teams. And um, the scrum teams are really only allowed to sort of create screens. Like you go run, run along and, and do the little stuff well, and let the adults get the real work done. So it's still very much, you know, the traditional mindset, like, okay, agile is not, not really serious kind of thing. So it's, but, and so at first I reacted fairly negative to, you know, strongly to that, but then um, and because I've asked them, I said, well, why don't we do go with feature teams? They said, oh, we've got to maintain, we've got to create a strong architecture. And if we don't have a good component team, we'll never make a strong architecture. And, and I was reacting to that. And now I started reading a book called Team Topologies. And it's giving me a little bit of a, a different perspective on it. And what they say is moving to feature teams is a big deal. It, and, and it's not something you can do overnight. And if, a, if a, it's sort of like taking a country that doesn't have a history of democracy and saying, guess what? You're going to have democracy now. Like it doesn't work. You know, yeah. it's a cultural shift. It happens over time. And so um, I'm starting to get a deeper appreciation that, oh, wow, this is going to be a complex multi-year process. <laughs> and so that's why I'm asking other coaches like, oh, have you been through this complex multi-year process? Because it's, it's this a doozy. Connect, this connects to the next question, which we had there from, from Henrik about yeah. uh, transforming and having organizations move. If I, if I may say one, one thing that I, I usually say is like one, many times we, 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 one thing that we lack in business usually is enough patience to let things happen at, their own, at the pace they need to happen. Sometimes we, can, we cannot afford the patience, perhaps. But the way we do transformations and we do this kind of change many times is, if you look at the natural world, when animals, any animal that transforms, what they need to do is that they take themselves out of a natural world, they transform, then they come in. Yeah, like caterpillar becomes a, a, a butterfly, but it spends whatever how many months as a cocoon outside of a natural world yeah in business we never do that we try to change while we are still running the business it's a king of a caterpillar jumping into the air and going please 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 grow me wings right now that's what we are doing with our transformations yeah um so so we many times put very very undue stress on on people to continue doing their jobs plus change plus find new figure out new solutions and all the stuff and this is problematic you know and I, i've done these mistakes before yeah the the scars of trying to get part of the organization very really agile and also then making sure as a result this agility that we had in part of the organization did not fit anymore with the rest of the organization what I liked about things like top team topologies is when it starts talking about less about the teams per se, but more about being conscious about the interfaces between teams. How do different teams collaborate? What is the context of each one of those teams or parts of organization? And trying to feel, I mean, we talk about like building policies, building agreements between those teams. How, how do they connect? And I think many times we don't do enough of that. In my opinion, it's like you you feel in this context. We're not going to change it over time. When people ask me how long is the trans transformation, I usually joke twenty eight years. What I mean is the rest of your career. You know what I mean? Um. So, but what we need to do many times about like it's all, it's less about how obviously you you may want things to change over time, but initially it's like how do we connect all these bits and pieces of the organization and 
perhaps stop them from actually conflicting with it with one another and try to start collaborating with one another whatever they do and however they do it um so that that's moral that, that's part of what, what how i take well at least my philosophy how i take on this kind of challenges any thoughts um lp or someone else craig someone else henrik you had a question about the transformation any thoughts on that on this topic well actually i think it was you know uh following up uh, directly on what craig is, is asking i'm i'm also sitting in a in a very mainframe based old school uh hierarchy waterfall way of thinking and i'm trying to and, and they are actually part of an uh an enterprise agile transformation so i'm trying to help them into start thinking more agile from the from the waterfall way of thinking uh, basically trying to pull the customer closer uh, get make quicker quicker decisions have different dialogues and whatnot but but as i'm just struggling into transforming them into the transformation so I'm, I'm looking for some kind of, uh, you know, not cases, but, you know, just some reflections on, yes, I have done it with a waterfall way of thinking into a, a flow-based way of thinking. I mean, I'm, I'm, all, uh, I'm all in for understanding what you're saying, uh, uh, Jose, about, uh, you know, it's a cultural change. It will take a very long time. It's not an overnight thing. Adopting Agile while also changing your way of work is, you know, cognitively just a massive uh, impact on, on everybody. But, you know, I still want to try and help them at least. And they're asking me all the time, so how do we do it? Cool. How do we get anyone to change? That's the question. Or how do we get a system to change? Just the same way we eat an elephant, right? Bit by bit. Yes, um, usually I, I, I mean, this is the, the, I think this is what this kind of question, I mean, if it was easy, none of us will have jobs, by the way. Yeah, it will be, it will be a, a resolve issue. Yeah. Um, the, the, the kind of like there is no, it's not going to be any magic solution, but it's many times for me, there is a confluence of three things that can happen. Um, and is an organization or part of an organization that is, is is at the same time reading ready willing and able to do something yeah um so the able is about like skilling people up uh, skilling people up making them aware showing them things you know, it's, it's sort of like perhaps you think about training and coaching and so on the willing is people wanting to do it so i go into the world of daniel metzik for example is, is metzik how do you pronounce his name I'm struggling now. Anyway, um, where he talks about like stop imposing change on people, stop forcing change. The amount of misery we have caused in the agile world to people that don't want to do agile or they were not ready to do agile. We need to learn that it's not us who should be doing the change. People have to be willing to do it. Yeah. And the other one is the readiness. Are there, are there, uh, environmental conditions whatever you want to say that allow people to be ready to do it so it's, it's, it's that moment when you when you spot the things that, pe that, that something is ready willing and able yeah when you can almost have a leap it's not this thing about like evolutionary change maybe sometimes you can even do pretty big changes but it's because there is that confluence of those three things and it's a spot in those moments when things are come when, when when big things can happen but that's really difficult isn't it? because you miss it you, you try to do it too soon or too late and you miss the moment mm. yeah so it's it's, it's kind of like it's, it's it's but our job is to be constantly looking for those you know a, a friend of mine andy Deville here in the uk he calls them about creating sparks where are the sparks and once you find the spark put fire get the fire going you're smiling LP. I like the analogy. I'm going to steal it in for my my workplace. What the sparks? Pyromaniac. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? I mean, um, it's, it's it's there is no magic recipe. In, in, unfortunately, there is patterns that we can do. There is things that we can do, but there is it's going to be so in the moment. Well, uh, sadly, I think you're right about everything. Mm -hmm. There's no there's no magic to it. I'm just you know I'm I'm looking for those small sparks. 
Mm -hmm. I just, you know, I want the signals. What kind of signals should I be looking for? Because right now I'm just scouting mm -hmm. all the time, right? And one of the one of the things I'm I'm scouting for is, mm -hmm. of course, when people start to ask questions, when they show interest, mm -hmm. they want to learn. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's a very good and clear signal. Curiosity. I mean, mm -hmm. so, but we, I mean, we are passing that point. Uh, Henrik, I, I don't know if you've read this book. Uh, it, it's a few years old. Uh, it's called Reinventing Organizations. Mr. Lalou. By Fred Lalou. Uh, mm -hmm. it, that book took a lot of pressure off of me as an agile coach or consultant as he described different colors for organizations like I think it's amber, orange, green, and teal. And, and when I get into a, a organization that is more amber, which is kind of lower here and it looks kind of condescending when I say it's lower, but the level of consciousness of that organization or department might not just be open to those agile transformations just because of the culture or level of consciousness of the organization. And I've used that to take a load off of myself to say, you know, Louis, you're in this amber situation. It's not going to happen because it's like that. And I'm, I'm going to wait, like you were saying, for people being curious, but I'm going to take that pressure off of me. Great point. Make, make um, Could you curious. repeat the, the name of, of that book? Reinventing Organizations. Oh. And it's by Frederick Lalou. Craig. I, I just wanted to mention that um, as Kanbanistas, we have to look no further than the Kanban maturity model. Is basically the KMM has taken that concept in reinventing organizations and and kind of expanded it and and really thought through it. So KMM level one, zero, level one, level two. It's a way of characterizing your organization in a pretty precise way according to practices, observable behaviors. Are you seeing this? Are you seeing this? Are you seeing this? Ah, you're probably in, in a level zero organization. And here's one or two things you might try to get you up to a level one organization. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty nice, uh, I think it's a huge addition to the, um, to the Kanban body of knowledge. And uh, there's a book about it and everything. Yeah. Website. If I, if I add a, wo a word of warning for, for me for love with any maturity model, is that what I observe with these things is that now I have people coming to me and say, hey, we have judged ourselves to be maturity level two, and I want you to be, make me level four. <laughs> and you're like, you just just totally abuse this. Um, <laughs> and unfortunately, maturity, maturity models is that, to be honest, that, that maturity, uh, maturity models are a consultant's paradise. It's kind of like, show me the money because companies many times just don't get what it actually means to do this kind of like thing. Yeah. And this in some like, okay, you want to be level four. What does that even mean? We, it's, it can be really, really, really powerful just well, but, but unfortunately I've seen companies just going into um, a management level. Someone says, Oh, you know, it would be nice to be level five. Like, does it even, do you know even that? Do we even know what that means in our context? The nice, the nice thing is the KMM, the book, yeah. spends a lot of time defining exactly what that means, how to look for it, what to, what to expect, what kind of practices, what kind of behaviors, uh, and what are the tiny, small, what's the smallest little thing you can do to take yourself, to help your organization grow from the level it's at to the next organization. And cool. so they've, they've done a tremendous amount of work on this so it's i definitely recommend people to read it you know mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's it's useful we all we want to have useful things and that work right another set of stuff to put in there yeah. absolutely exactly I, I the smallest bit of thing I, that connects to the next question let's go to the next question which is uh, cyprian you had a question about um i know the next bit go for it yeah so uh this question comes a bit from experience because it's uh from Let's say let's share an observation working with a few organizations to do agile transformation. Basically, when you let teams self-organize in any way they, they want to do it, you know, some choose Scrum, some choose Kanban. And mm -hmm. usually most of the teams choose Kanban. And what they understand by Kanban, it's it's more or less having a Kanban board in a way or another, in a tool or something like that. And that's kind of like that, that's something that I observe. And and my question is basically how can you get them hooked? with flow optimization is there one thing that you can get them started basically 
because yeah, it, 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 it's harder to do that with, with Kanban. And I've seen that, you know, and I've seen how, how teams uh, evolve in time. And the ones that choose Scrum for whatever reason, they, they, they will go much faster than the ones with Kanban, at least in, in my, my case here. Yeah. Is there something that can get them started? You know, something like a... I'll, I'll let Jose first and then I, I want to jump in. I've got, I've got an answer, but I, I want to... Or Go Jose, okay, on, okay, on. okay. Well, my first, uh, my first part of the answer would be, uh, I, I so love the metric part from the Kanban guide, because finally we've got some, some uh, um, conversation about time. Because if we just talk about the workflow, I never had a, a, a way of talking about time, as with Scrum with the iteration and always talking about the two or three week iteration. It kind of put pressure to people. So, okay, we've got no more pressure in Kanban. Not true. We've got, for example, the age of items. So I'll, I'll, I'll bring the age of item. I don't know if Cyprian, if that's something you've tried to show them that some things are just getting older. And with the SLE, with the service level expectation, once again, I cross my fingers that in 10 years, in 2030, SLE, I'm, not, I'm, I'm gonna be out of the job. I so wish I won't have to explain that to anybody because the SLE plus work item age not going to say that it works a beauty, but it gives some uh, uh, perspective on how well they're doing or not so well. So the whole metric part really helped me to start that conversation. Cyprian or Jose, do you folks want to add something? So, I mean, I think you've, you've covered it pretty much. I, I, one thing that I will add to this perhaps is that that there are things, unfortunately, I think, and unfortunately, some of the language that we use um, have co create cognitive barriers for a lot of people, especially they use the term whip limit or limiting whip, for example. Um, that many times clashes with the mindset of like ever expanding, doing more, give me more velocity, give me more throughput, we want to do more. The word limit is an absolute cognitive cognitive conflict. And perhaps there's no bad to have that conflict, but many times creates a lot of resistance. I prefer to use other words like balance, you know, balance whip, balance your capacity with, the, with, with, your, with your demand or demand with capacity. Yeah. Ensure that you ensure that we come and done well is an extremely humanistic way of working. And, and, and something we have created because we love the metrics, but the metrics are to help people make better decisions and ask better questions early on. It's a very humanistic approach. If we stick with the metrics and we start talking about process and things like that, it sounds like we are just, you know, process junkies, you know, and that puts people off. So, so one of the things that I always will, will suggest is like, always remember that we're trying to do this to help create better work environments for human beings. If someone has resources, I scream, <laughs> for example. Um, with that in mind, yeah, um, to help people have better work environments, uh, things like what we said before, like tr starting to parallelize CFDs, if you can visualize that, that's useful because that's a sign of stability. It might be that we still have too much work and eventually you have to, to, to narrow it. But most organizations are like that. Forever more and more. I mean, called this, this Helen make in the UK, that's called the crocodile mouth. Yeah. When we take more work than we can deliver, we die, we collapse like that. Companies die. Yeah. So try to parallelize those lines. Pay attention to aging. Aging is a great way to get people to start to start thinking in about whip without the resistance that whip limits create. Mm -hmm. Because if 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 the work is just aging and dying there, there is less incentive to start more work. There is incentive to start finishing. Yeah. So combine things like parallel CFDs, introduce aging, move towards SLEs for, for forecasting and so on. That's that's a great step, but always, always, always to improve people's lives. It's not about it's not about the process in that way. It's always to improve people's life, and that's where I will go. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Very powerful answer. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, 
something else someone else wants to add something How, uh, any anybody else try something else i mean again we could look, talk about like defining workflow visualizing workflows creating creating boards all these things are important of course yeah but even without those things like some of those metrics can help people start making some changes that are in the right direction because most of the times are just most of us are just overworked cool Someone else question. any, any uh, contributions or should we go to another question? I think the next question would be uh, Yevon's question about uh, expanding the definition of a workflow. Jack, go for it, Jack. Yeah, um, it was a long time ago, but anyway, I'm interested in your opinion around this. Um, we've done Kanban transformation in a company and we started in the development at the point when we achieved a kind of stability. We start expanding our workflow. We are adding everything that happens before and after in our workflow. And every time when we include one step, actually in that particular example, we face blockers, we face new queues, and our work in progress grows. And then actually, for example, our SLE doesn't make sense as soon as we include every step. Um, do you have any thoughts about this? Because the biggest problem we face there is um, actually a team and management were completely disappointed. Like we achieved stability, we have predictability, we include something, that's it. We need to do everything from scratch. Okay. Um, I, can I, can I quickly answer a question? Go for it, Jose, yeah. So um, um, in, we call, um, unfortunately, the name um, now raises a lot of things, but in, in training, for example, we had something that we called it the six trumps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for data, we, we were talking about the, 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 the data trumps. What that meant was that, for example, one of the trumps is um, recent data will always trump all data. Yeah. And relevant data will trump data that has become obsolete in some way. If you are changing the system, it is possible that the data that you have until now no longer represents the new system. And any change will also create a, a, cert, a certain period of instability. I don't know if I'm, if I'm going in the direction of your question, Jack, there. But whenever you change things, instability happens until the, until the new system emerges. Small changes might create very, very little changes. Big changes could create much more instability and it take longer to, to settle. That's why transformations many times organizationally are very, very difficult to handle. Yeah. But what can happen with any, any improvement that you do is that the data that you have before from before is no longer, it might, it might be less relevant or totally completely obsolete. Fortunately, we only need a few data points to start going back to see how stable, how good the system works. Have I, am I answering the question that you had or have I gone in a direction that is not your question? I'm just. No, no, yeah, you, you definitely go in, in the right direction. Um... Yeah. So, so sometimes, sometimes it's like, you know, you, you've any time to you do a change, potentially you have to put a little bit of a skepticism on what the new date, what the data is telling you. And probably um, it's good to actually, um, it's good to actually uh discard data that is no longer representative or is too far too far in the past i i i sent this go and say okay i've got three years worth of data and think like well, that's probably actually really really bad thing to have because three years ago you might not even have a single person that was working here in this team anymore or in this organization yeah the organization or the team or whatever it is is different so i might be using you know even even the last 50 data points that could be the last 50 stories or the last 50 days worth of work whatever yeah but i would add to was recent data because it's going to be probably probably it's going to be more representative of what you are experiencing today cool and we're using that historical data to forecast so at least it has to be as accurate or as representative as you can but yeah any change any change it's meant to have an impact cool any thoughts on that the lp myself. i'm all good all good that means i answer the question okay <laughs> um 
Was there any other question that we saw somewhere? Yeah, Amit would be the next one about, uh, he has a question about Flowmaster. Uh, Amit, would you mind if I were just, uh, if you want to ask it uh, out loud? Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask about the concept of Flowmaster because I think um, uh, Cyprian uh, also mentioned about uh, the team which is embarking on the journey to adopt Kanban, right? Uh, typically the scrum construct means I'm just trying to take the vis-a-vis -vis analogy. If uh, someone is trying to go uh, or become agile, the first is you introduce the change agent uh, because it has to be someone external. Uh, you can't uh, cook something within itself. Uh, so you have to induct that change agent. And then the process uh, means things start evolving uh, around that person. And uh, there is a shift in mindset which comes up. So uh, means if uh, Craig was giving the analogy of 60% still doing Kanban and calling it a life cycle method or whatever uh, their proprietary ways of working, which are not Scrum, then why don't we see the standardized adoption of that being formalized uh, with a change agent? Because it gives a leeway to all the consulting companies to come and say, we will do your transformation because there is no defined <laughs> rule to say that you can do it yourself. So that, that's where uh, the context I wanted to give uh, to my question, yeah. Uh, but I, I can maybe give a, a, a part of my answer for this, Amit, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm looking at your flow master question. Is it kind of relevant also? Yeah. Uh, for, for me, what I really like about the compound guide is as it defines it only as a strategy to deliver uh, value items for a pull system, just that it's, it's, a, it's a strategy of delivering work or value work or, or potential value. I find that it just uh, remove constraints on people who want to implement it in their own organization. And I like it because it doesn't force consultant to come in. It's just, I'm gonna read this and I'm gonna apply it without even the help of, of, of consultant because I don't have to change or add new roles, it respects my organization and I can become that change agent if I want, but we won't impose that flow master role. That's that's what I like about the pro Kanban version of the Kanban guide. It's just it's just a strategy. And let's look at how we are delivering work with our metrics. Let's measure based on the Kanban metrics and see if we're, we're, we might have some room for improvement. So I like it that it's just not defined in there. So it's not forced upon someone to become a, a, a change agent formally known in the organization. Yes, uh, uh, Craig. Indeed, I have a perspective on this. Um, so the flow manager, um, as it's sometimes defined, is a good role to have. But we have to remember that Kanban, at first, one of the principles of Kanban is, especially in the beginning, we respect existing roles and we don't force people to change. We don't say, you've been a PMP for 20 years. Guess what? That's irrelevant. Everything you learned for 20 years, throw it away. You're now a scrum master. So we don't do violence to people. We, we, take, we start right where we are and we slowly evolve. So, and also you got to think about, so if somebody has a self-identity as a project manager, that's what they want to be called. Guess what? That's, that's what you're going to be called. If they may be um, known as a scrum master and we're going to start infusing some Kanban practices in our, in our scrum, do we say, oh, you're no longer a scrum master? No, we allow them to still call themselves a scrum master. That's completely fine. Absolutely no problem. Now, imagine if you have a, and that's at the team level. Now, imagine at the uh, flight level two. The flight level two, who might the facilitator be? Would they be called a flow manager or would they be called like a product manager, a VP of product development? You know, they probably have a title today. And so taking that title away and saying, you're going to be a flow manager, it, that, that's not the Kanban style, right? And now think about a flight level three at the strategy level. Who might the facilitator be there? They might be the CIO. They might even be the CEO. They might be a, a senior VP or an executive VP of some kind of thing. So basically who the facilitators are would tend to be very different at the different flight levels of, of a Kanban system for an enterprise. So 
between that and exist and also our prince our practice of respecting existing um uh, roles and 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 responsibilities in East initially, before, as we st then start to change evol and evolve slowly, means that you know yes, there are flow managers out there. Absolutely, there are, but it's not like to do Kanban, you're going to have to have a flow manager. Not at all. That's not our style. Yeah. Um, if I, if I add something to this, one of the things that uh, again the, the reason why we all have jobs many times is because they, they this every company is going to be a different context so there might be there might be patterns that are recognizable and there might be approaches that you might try which are similar but but we should never ever ever try to do the you know because it worked in that company i'm going to try to do the same thing because it's already a different company that's that's the mistake that we see with the spotify when everybody says, i want to be spotify well are you a spotify no well then don't try um but um there's an interesting thing that I made that you were saying there, which is which is actually quite 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 important. Is this thing that this idea that it's really 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 difficult for I'm not going to say impossible. It can be really really difficult to change a system from within. Exactly. Okay. Now, with that in mind, if we if what we are doing as a change agent is for us to nurture or foster or create the opportunities for people to then do the change that might be great what we shouldn't try to do is to go and say i've got the answers you do you know go and do this there is a pattern of follow this or follow this recipe and all this stuff um i i usually i usually say that every time we tell someone how to change or what to change we are robbing them from the opportunity to find better solutions than ours because we might not have a scheme in the game at all. Enough is scheme in the game. So is this 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 balance between yes, it's important to some to have potentially someone external to the system to help the system change, but it shouldn't be at the it shouldn't be that should not be done, I think, yeah, through imposition. It should be done through um getting people's curiosity, getting people aware of, of options they have, getting people more given permission to do things as well. So it's, it's, through, it's much more through invitation and and creating the opportunities and making people even believe. I, sometimes I say like, the, you know, uh, when I'm as a coach, my job is to be the safety net. You don't want to ever see the safety net. The, the safety net is, is great when it's invisible. When you notice the safety net, it's because someone has fallen into it. Yeah. So our job is to become invisible, but help the organization change. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm going philosophical today. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Because many people feel that uh, means you can inject agility yeah. by implementation of the role. So my question was uh, obviously to make the flow master role irrelevant. Uh, and that's what I wanted to drive the discussion. So uh, thanks a lot. You have given much more needed context. Um, by the way, I don't know in, in other in other countries. At least in the UK, uh, the the term I know Flowmaster is being used, but Flowmaster is a toilet brand. I hate the name. <laughs> I just think toilets. <laughs> it's okay. Um, and I know it's been used, but sometimes it's like don't 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 please don't do that. <laughs> it doesn't translate everywhere. Awesome. Um, good, 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 good. Um, any, um, we've, we've got like four minutes. If someone has a really, really, really quick question, we might use that time. Uh, you know, anyone has a very quick question? I have one. Come on. Louis Philippe, what's your success rate with implementing Kanban? Is it one out of three or one out of two or one out of 10? What's your uh, measurement to uh, qualify success? <laughs> That's a nice comeback. When you feel you are a success. When I get fired, that would be my uh, criteria for success. Mm -hmm. uh, I never get fired. I, I, I often leave by myself. Uh, because people get addicted to uh, the questions or the uh, Okay, I could go in that that continuous improvement loop that I usually bring to company and organization. Uh, they enjoy that. But if, if I would say if I have success, it, it, I get fired. I know I, I got to leave now. There's no much. I'm I'm useless. 
Does that answer your question, Henrik? Yeah, well, since it's a philosophical uh, day today, <laughs> it does. I'm just looking for the numbers. What would you say? Is it one out of three times that you try to implement Kanban, or one out of four or five? Or... It's not every time, right? <laughs> I've had more failures uh, uh, in my market. It's more in my part of the world. It's more a scrum world than a Kanban world. So uh, people want to do more scrum than Kanban and ha people have a good misunderstanding of the definition of Kanban. So I am failing because we're not in line. And that's why I, and I'm going to wrap it this way. I, I, I became a pro Kanban trainer is I want to teach the right way of doing Kanban. And I, I believe I'm in the right organization to, to do that. Yeah. yeah the reason you know, I'm asking is, is of yeah. course not to, you know, hang you out there is to, you know, we have to remind ourselves it's, it's difficult. If your yeah. organization is, is different. And I mean, I think my Kanban trainer, he said, I mean, if I have a hit rate of one out of four, then I'm happy, actually. I, I was going to say that if if I was if I was really 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 critical about like what I will hope for the client and what actually happens by the time I go, I would say zero percent <laughs> because there is so because there is always more to start with. Yeah, um, am I proud of what clients have achieved? Yes. Yeah, is it is it yeah, maybe maybe it's, maybe even one one every four is is high, occasionally because I mean the things about again agility and 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 Kanban and things like that for me again they really really mature they really come to to they really make a real impact when you take them beyond the team and a lot of agile that, that we are asked to do or we have opportunity to do in organizations is within the team, mm -hmm. so I am eternally dissatisfied. I want to see is agility beyond the team. That's what I mean. Craig was talking about flight levels. Yeah, is bringing agility, business agility, to the business or agility to the business. Yeah, um, but that is a job that it's you, you. You have to measure it in years. And again, our job is to make ourselves kind of like re redundant before the job is over, so the organization can continue on their own. The companies that I'm proud of what they done is because after I left, they continued their their, their journey, and you go and see them again one, two years down the line, and it's like, this place is awesome how it has moved. I mean, I, I, I feel really sad when a lot of effort has happened in an organization and they just they couldn't sustain it. You go back two or three years and they've gone back to all the old habits. Mm. That that just saddens me, yeah? And and there is a lot of that, to be honest. I mean, you said when there used to be an Agile Awards, uh, you know when people do like things like competitions and they do the program that says like, what happened to them three or four years down the line? <laughs> When people have these case studies of incredible agility, success, I would like to do the three or four years down the line to see how actually it sustained itself. Yeah. And I'm sure it happened, yeah, but I would like to see much more of that, you know, how, how it actually is sustained over many, many years. Yeah, I'm very critical. I will say even zero because, you know, there is always more that you could do. Yeah. Yeah. And that depresses me. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be depressed. Um, one of the amazing things about Kanban is even a little, little bit of Kanban can help you. Mm -hmm. It is not like other methods, agile methods. It really isn't. It's not like extreme programming, which only works if you do every single part of extreme programming, right? Even a tiny, even personal Kanban can help you. So I very much use the analogy of a team coach like a soccer coach. If, if you bring in a soccer coach and you start winning just a little bit more games than you used to, is that soccer coach successful? Yes, they are. Now, could they be more successful? Yes. How are you more successful? More coaching. So are you ever done with a coach? Do you ever not need a coach? Does an Olympian fire their coach? Hey, I'm done. I, I want a gold medal. I don't need a coach anymore. Of course not. A coach is always helpful. But uh, even just a tiny bit of Kanban can help you. Simple, simple stuff. It's not hard. Kanban maturity model gives you a, from the simplest like tinker toys all the way to space shuttle and, and everything in between. So there, there's a lot to Kanban. There's, there's literally hundreds of practices and you can start at any level and you can go to any level. So there's a lot out there. So. Oh, we are over our time box. So 
Thank you very much. I just to say th thank you for great questions, great conversations. I, I really appreciate um, all your participation. Um, Louis Philippe, it's been a pleasure to have you here. Hopefully, we can get you back again soon. Um, Likewise. This video will be in uh, in um, in the YouTube channel um, probably even tonight. The link is on the chat. So, and if you're watching this after we record this because you found it, so that's okay. Um, and if you want to keep the conversation going, um, come to uh, join the program and community um, Slack channel. That's where you know we can have conversations like this. Um, meetup group. Hopefully, that's how you found the the session and so on. And if you speak Spanish, tomorrow we have our first version of this in Spanish with um, Ulises Gonzalez from Panama. So. Keep, you know, keep the flow going. How is it like live long and prosper? No, live long and flow on. Yeah, that, that's just like, no, forget, just mixing terms, you know, Star Wars, Star Trek and all the stuff. Thank you very much, everyone. It's been great. I really appreciate it. And we'll see you on the next one. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. See you. Bye. bye.